Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Happy Wednesday to you, and it's happy because, well, the Pelicans won again. 16 games above 500, matching the win total of a season to go. Oh, my goodness. And the lob. I I don't know. Was it a good pass or was it not? Najee Marshall to Zion Williamson. Good pass, bad pass, or just great play? Unbelievable when you see it in slow motion. What did it sound like on the Pelicans Radio Network? Najee with the pick. alley oop Fly, big boy. And that's what everybody in this building has been waiting for all night long. The soaring. As for after the game, Zion had this to say on that play. Throw it up. Because it was crazy because me and him had like just talked about it. He said, hey, man, you need to you go to the paint. You need to start dunking. So when he got the, uh, when he got the steal, I said, oh, he's throwing it. So he threw a good pass and went and got it. I, I kind of mentioned it just now. We have to touch on it. Win number 42. Why is that significant to you? All right, Jim, always a pleasure when we have you on, sir. Uh, and always a pleasure when we're talking about a win. How nice is it the Pelicans getting win number 42, the significance of that, what they did yesterday, the law pass, all of that, man. Your overall thoughts on beating the Nets. Yeah, it's funny. I didn't even really think about the fact that this was the second straight winning season that they had going into that game until it was mentioned afterwards. But that is pretty cool to think about that they haven't done that since – 2009 where they've had two seasons in a row with a winning record and I think there's a bunch of other stuff on the list that they're going to try to accomplish for the first time since either 2008 or 2009 with one of those being 50 wins in a regular season but it was great to see the Pelicans again just come out breathing fire on the road against the Eastern Conference team and re really leaving no doubt that this is not going to be a game where the opposing team really has much of a chance to win. Still 14 games to go here. Here's what Zion had to say after the game on matching last year's win total. <coughs> uh, it's very exciting, but um, we got to keep building. Uh, talked about it beginning of the season, middle of the season, and now we're coming towards the end of the season. Uh, we just got to keep getting better because we want to be a contender. We got to keep like getting better with those small nuances in the game. Willie Green on hitting win 42. I, I give all the credit to God. I'm, I'm grateful to be in this position, to have an opportunity to coach this, these amazing guys in our locker room, um, work with, with all of our incredible staff. So it starts with that. It starts with having the high character people around us that allow us to be the best that we can. And um, it, it's truly a joy to come in every day and get an opportunity to grow and be better. And Jim, I don't know about you, but if I'm a Pels fan, I love hearing what Larry Nance has to say about matching the win total. This is how you build a winning franchise. You know, it doesn't happen. You know, those those franchises that, you know, just go from low wins to 60 wins, that that's not sustainable. You know, you build a successful franchise, an successful roster, successful team by, you know, steady growing, steady improving, keeping keeping the core together and and really um learning to play with and alongside each other. You know, that's what Denver did. That's what Milwaukee had done. That's what, you know, Golden State, you know, like teams, you build. You build. You start slow and you build. And and, and the fact that we've gone from, I should say, they went from, what, 1-12 in 12 three years ago to, you know, where we're at now is a testament to Willie, testament to Griff, Swin, Trage, Bryce, um, B-I-Z, everybody has been here along the way. You know, they're doing this the right way, and I'm just I'm proud to be a part of it. All right, so you heard from those three men. I mean, look, here's the thing. There's so much more to go, but you have to take the steps, Jim. You can't become a contender. You can't become a perennial playoff franchise like the Spurs were for 20-plus years. You have to start somewhere. So I love hearing the players say they're building. I love hearing the players yesterday get asked, how's Willie Green growing? And Zion saying, our relationship is growing. Look, we touched on it over the weekend in that Clippers game. Him and and Coach Green on the sideline drawing up plays. Him hugging Willie Green after that Clipper game. Look, I, I close my eyes, and I've mentioned this before in the podcast or my talk show. I don't remember. I'm old. But 
when I close my eyes and I think of of Jordan, you know, he's tugging on his shorts, leaning over, listening to Phil Jackson, Kobe or Shaq with Phil Jackson. Whatever. When you think of coaches and player relationships, those that win titles, the, the Warrior guys next to Steve Kerr, you know, the moment of them talking about the game, and Zion even mentioned it yesterday, that that is happening. They're talking about the game, what's going on the court. That's trust, that's collaboration, that's buy-in. You're starting to see that from all the players with Willie Green. Yeah, it was interesting listening to that, and I feel like we've heard kind of bits and pieces of that throughout the season, but it's great to see it all coming together. I mean, think about it. Two seasons ago, they won 36 games where the nine seed got through the play-in. Last year, they won 42 games, got knocked out of the play-in, but still they won six more than the year before. Right now, they're already at 42. Hopefully, they'll win you know, eight, ten more games than they did last year. So they're continuing to make more steps. I mean, there's a very good possibility that this is going to be the highest seed that New Orleans has had in 15 years as well. So, I mean, they had a six seed in 2018, but, I mean, there's a really good chance for them to do better than that as well, maybe even get up to four. So they're, they're definitely making steps. And, I mean, it's one thing to talk about it, but when you just see the tangible evidence of it and you see the numbers of the win progression that they they keep making it's very encouraging about the future and speaking about the future mr will gillery of the athletic who covers the your, your new orleans pelicans and the miami heat for the athletic will preview the next two games and get his thoughts on if he could have caught that lob or not all right will always a pleasure when you well jesus i said well i meant to make him well jim we always are very fortunate we're gonna get a little time from will gillery of the athletic covers your new orleans pelicans the miami heat the nba has got all of the answers including could you have caught zion's lob pass from naji if we're playing on a six foot goal and dunked oh man i don't know if i would have been able to catch it with two hands maybe one oh, hand i don't know if i could reach that far back with two hands and complete the dunk <laughs> So I mean, yeah, that was that was a high level of difficulty on that one. I definitely could have caught the ball if I was allowed to give like a fair catch. If I was allowed to like walk back a few steps and kind of settle underneath it, I wouldn't have been able to do anything with it after I caught the ball. But as far as just catching it, I I think I could have done that if if I had you know a little time to do a fair catch. But no, always glad to have you on the show, Will. As you know, you're one of our favorite guests. I'm hoping to get through this without any Brother Martin references, but although I guess I just made one. There it myself. is. That is Don't hold your breath, happened. brother. Don't well, hold I'll your breath. say this. Yesterday at the Pell's Watch Party at Evangeline Lounge, tons of Brother Martin baseball parents were there. Because, you know, Brother Martin, like the tailgate before our high school baseball games. <laughs> it was chock full of Brother Martin people as they were opening up district play to take on Holy Cross at Kirsch Rooney. I'm like, what's going on over here? So it's right down the street from Kirsch Rooney. But it was awesome. All right, so there you go. That's your second Brother Martin. Right okay. We like yeah. the tailgate for high school baseball. I, I feel like in addition to the Brother Martin obligatory That's reference, I felt like we kind of had to start this conversation today with Zion Williamson and going back to the Brooklyn game last night. When you when you think about the way that he played last night, he had 28 points and just what we've seen from him the last five or six games. Do you feel like this is kind of what we envisioned from him? We, I mean, even going back all the way to 2019 in terms of, you know, what what some of the things that he's been capable of and what he looks like when he's at that. I don't know if he's still saying that he's not quite 100 percent, but he's getting closer and closer to that. No, Jim, it's crazy because I think for two reasons, I would probably say no. I, I, I really didn't envision Zion getting to this point. Well, my bad. For one, I mean, I was having conversations with people not too long ago where I was saying, hey, guys, we're not going to see Duke Zion again, and it's fine. He's still a great mm -hmm. player. He still scores so many points in the paint. He He's not jumping and doing 360 windmills like he was doing at Duke, but that's okay. And I would say, I tweeted this a few games ago, I think he's looking like Duke Zion again, the way he's throwing down these massive dunks, the way he's sprinting. He's looking like a sprinter and, and fast break situations, jumping past people, running past people. Yeah, I think his athleticism is off the charts. And I think for a second reason, I think defensively he's so much better than we've seen throughout his career. And I think that's another concession a lot of Pelicans fans probably gave with Zion. They said, hey, he's so good offensively. We're fine with him being a below average defender, right? He, he long as he's giving us 28, he could be bad defensively. And I think you've seen lately that – He's been like more than average defense. I think he's been really good defensively. The way he's moving mm -hmm. his feet, 
blocking shots. He's taking on different defensive assignments. We saw him take on that Kawhi Leonard mm-hmm. assignment in the Clippers game. I think he's I think he's really a step above what we kind of projected what he would look like even when he got back to fully healthy. So I think it's been so impressive what he's been able to do these past few weeks. And I think so much of it is just him kind of taking his game even a level above what I thought he can get to at this point in his career. It was interesting. Last night at the end of the game, the first question was about, you know, the win. What was the key? Will and Jim, his answer was two seconds, defense to offense. It, it's literally your point. It's ingrained in him. He, he's he been saying it, but that was literally his first answer yesterday out of the entire game, defense to offense. And, and Will, I think the, the key for me is the team that you follow closely and follow to the NBA Finals, they got there because of their defense as well, right? I mean, they predicate that. They have certain practices, the Miami Heat, to try to do things of that nature. So that's why I think it is important that you just brought that up that you have a player of that magnitude. We started out talking about the lob. We see the athleticism. We see the ability to be able to dominate in the paint. But when you have him buying in and literally saying defense to offense, like that's that's his religion right now. That's how he sees success. How key is that so early in his career that a player of that status sees that? Oh, no question. And when we talk about Miami being consistently great defensively year in and year out, a big reason behind that is because Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo set that standard every single night. That's what they talk about. That's what they care about in practice. When they lose games, they say, hey, we got to play better defensively. And that's the standard in that building, that they want to be great defensively first, and then everything else falls behind that. And I think uh, that's the conversation we had so often about Zion Williamson and Brandon Ingram, that these two guys are great. But do they care enough about defense? And if they don't, how does that reflect on everybody else on the team, right? Uh, I think that's something that we saw, especially Mm -hmm. during the Stan Van Gundy season, where they were putting up amazing numbers, but they were giving up 130 every game. And it was like, yeah, the two stars are putting up great numbers, but they don't care about defense, so nobody cares about defense. And I think now you see Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson really not only putting in the effort defensively, but they're talking about it every game. They're they're making it the standard. They're making it, okay, this is the beginning point, and then everything else falls in line behind that. And I think that's been a huge part of this team's success. And as crazy as it sounds, I know I said Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo are the guys who set that standard in Miami here in New Orleans. I honestly think it's Herb Jones. I think those guys follow Herb Jones standard on defense and he lays the foundation of what they're going to be and everybody else kind of falls in line. And it sounds crazy to say for a guy who's a second round pick who who's making like 12, 13 a year uh, to be the standard bearer. But I really do think Herb Jones has that type of effect on his teammates where he brings it so much every single night. Those guys say, Hey, I can't be the guy that's not trying hard when Herb Jones is out there diving on the floor, guarding five people, protecting the rim, getting steals. How how am I going to be the guy that's not trying Mm -hmm. when he's out there doing what he's doing every night? And I think it's made a a massive difference for this team. Well, we're going to get into some specifics about this really interesting Orlando Miami back to back in Florida that the Pelicans are about to go on. But w- one more thing I was w- wanted to ask you about Zion, you know, just from being around him and talking to him over the course of the season and seeing the way that he's been lately, and even just some the way that he's reacted more emotionally on the court, it just seems like he's so happy and he's, you know, just loving life right now with just the way things are going. I mean, what what is your impression or your per- perspective on him in terms of just the way that he's carried himself lately and, just the impact that he's had as far as it just seems like, you know, I, I hate to be too much of a body language doctor sometimes, but mm-hmm. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on just the way that he's, he's kind of conducted himself the way that he, he looks on the court. Now, for one, and Jim, you know this, I think the guy's just happy to be healthy for as long mm-hmm. as he's been. I think that's the number one thing we talk mm-hmm. about with Zion is that people always, you know, question his motivation or, you know, how much he really loves basketball or how much he wants to really do what it takes to be great. And I think what you've seen this season is just him getting that joy back, just being able to play the game, being able to practice every day, being around his teammates. I think you, especially during that season where he had the injured foot, you heard him saying stuff like, yeah, mentally, I just wasn't right. I was in a bad place just because I couldn't play and I wanted to play and I was on the court and I just didn't feel right. And I think that was a big struggle for him just being on the court and being like, man, I'm not me. I'm not Zion. And I don't mm-hmm. know what to do to fix it. 
right? And I think that's a big struggle that people don't realize with athletes when they go through injuries, they kind of go through that identity crisis. Like, man, what's going on with me? I don't know how to be me. And I think you feel like you, you see now with Zion that he's really back to being himself. He's playing with that joy. He's playing with that big smile on his face. And he really feels like himself on the court again. And the other part is, I really do think he's got a big old chip on his shoulder. <laughs> and I do mm -hmm. think after that in-season tournament, he heard what everybody else was saying. I can assure you, he heard what everybody was saying. And, and I think having the whole basketball world kind of give up on you the way they did, I think that was something that affected him. And I think he's he's out to really prove a lot of people wrong. And I think, you know, I wrote this after that game. I think a lot of star players, they need to go through a little bit of failure early in their career to have that moment where they look in the mirror and say, okay, I can't blame the injuries. I can't blame my teammates. I can't blame the coaching. This was my fault. <laughs> we got smoked in front of the whole world and I got to take the blame. So now how am I going to respond? And I think that was really the first moment he had like that as a pro after the in-season tournament. And I think he's been a different guy ever since. And I think the same is true for the rest of the team that they had dealt with that embarrassment and they bounced back in a major way and they're out to really prove the world wrong that a lot of the stuff people were saying about them back in December uh, is they got to come, they got to stand on that come April. I just want to quickly add to that. I brought that up Monday uh, on the show guys on Saturday after the win, he was asked about when he said that I needed to take a back seat at that time. And even on Monday, will I, I said that was a sign of maturity actually, you know, to me and, and I welcomed it. It's okay to say, not there yet. I need help. I'm not ready. Um, he talked about CJ and others stepping up. You know, Willie Green earlier in the season talked about Herb Jones being the captain, how they pushed him to do that. So I, when when you look at this growth, it's been a process. Them understanding how many games back to back, you know, scheduling those days off, trying to get him healthy. But to your point, the mental aspect, I love that he actually said that. I, I remember saying that on the show, I'm like, this isn't there's no reason to pile on him. I, I like hearing you say that, yo, I'm, I'm not there yet. Cause I can't be there physically. So I'm not the leader. I'm not the franchise player. I'm not the guy that you go to just yet. And then he answered it on Saturdays. Like I'm getting there or I'm ready, you know, and you hear CJ say, Hey, he pulled me aside Friday said, I need this from you. You see him with Willie green drawing up plays. You see him hugging Willie green. You see him talking about, the, their relationship growing you're seeing a guy that's starting to be ready to take that but i i think in this day and age man i i gotta give him credit for that's not easy to do you know screaming a was ready to jump on that and everybody else <laughs> so I, I give him credit for that to be able to say that because i, I think it take takes maturity to be able to say I, i'm not there yet i'm not ready i need help no, I think that's been important for all of the, each of the, the big three, whether it be B.I., Zion, and C.J. kind of having that willingness to put their ego to the side. And I think that was a, a big, uh, you know, talking point for those guys during some of those team meetings earlier in the season. It felt like every other week there was a team meeting in, in New Orleans, uh, you know, after an ugly loss. It was like, yeah, we had another players meet only meeting. And I think a lot of times they were having those talks behind the scenes. They were saying, yeah, we got to – be willing to step aside and, and say, hey, it's okay for if B.I. has a night. It's okay if it's Zion's night. It's okay if it's C.J.'s night. And I think you've seen that throughout the season, especially with B.I. and Zion, that willingness to say, hey, he's hot. I'll go stand in the corner. Do you? And I think you, you, you've seen a couple of times in the past few weeks where Brandon Negram will have 11 points, and he'll be like, I'm fine. And, you know, Zion's going crazy. I don't need the ball. I don't need to go put up 39 and, and 8 and 8 and 6 like he was doing last year as they were making the push for the uh for the playing tournament. And I asked B.I. this question. I said, hey, it's not easy for a guy when you know you're capable of dominating a game but I'm willing to stand aside and allow somebody else to take care of it. And he said, yeah, that's a part of winning See, the willingness mm -hmm. to, to give the ball up, the, to have, have a selfless mentality. And I think that's something that's been a priority for this entire team. And we can go to CJ, mm -hmm. a guy who has averaged 20 points a game, what 10 years in a row in this league. We know, we know CJ's a, a, a capable bucket and he's, completely changed his game this year he said yeah. i'm taking threes only i'm not running pick and rolls i don't need to be a point guard a i came here to, to be a up. point guard and i don't want to be a point guard because i want these guys to shine and i think that's been a process for those three guys throughout this season to kind of give themselves up be willing to change their game play with a different perspective for the greater good and i think that's a part of maturity i think that's part of you know dealing with some losing like i said yeah. you, you, 
dealing with some losing, it'll change your perspective. It'll change your priorities. And I think also uh, you got to give Willie Green a lot of credit. Just the, the amount of times he's had conversations with these guys behind the scenes, laying out a clear vision of what he wants it to look like. And I think those guys are buying in. And I think, again, when your stars are buying in and playing selfless and playing defense, everybody else can help but follow. Yeah, to, and to your point, you've seen Zion and heard him this year when B.I. was cooking. He's like, get out the way, you know, give him the ball and cook. So and, and, and it all smiles like he means that he he if he if the guy is going, Zion will be the facilitator. We've seen high assist games as well. Yeah, and hopefully we're all going to learn. They're all going to see how much more credit they get and recognition they get to be on a team that wins 50 games. Bingo. And goes to the playoffs and hopefully has a chance to advance pretty deep compared to the credit that you get or don't get when maybe you have a slightly better stats, but the team doesn't win and doesn't make the playoffs on an annual basis. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, to your point as well. Will, will in turn, hey, Jim, we've heard how many times we've heard Zion say this exact phrase, the people remember, remember winners, right? That's, right. that's what he's, he, mm -hmm. he's told us a million times this year. I don't care about my numbers. I don't care what people think about me. I care about winning. And that's what people mm -hmm. are going to remember. And I think that's what these guys are really buying into now. Sure. I think eventually everyone comes to that conclusion, especially if you've been on a team that hasn't accomplished a lot, you know, year in and year out. L last thing, Will, we wanted to, you know, focus a little bit on this back to back that the Pelicans have Orlando Thursday, Miami Friday, which I, I think is one of the most interesting back to backs they've had all season. If you look at the opponents and kind of the situation, I guess let's start with the magic. Um, to me, they're one of my favorite teams in the Eastern conference to watch on league pass. There's just a lot of interesting young talent that they have. What, what's your reaction to them being in fifth place though? I mean, I think people thought that they were going to make an improvement, but for them to be in that lofty category right now what are your thoughts on that yeah i think for one the way we talk about the job willie green has done this year we got to say the same thing about jamal mosley mm -hmm. and the way he's built up that young roster got them buying into playing the right way uh got them playing a funky style uh they're very similar to the pelicans where they got these two big forwards who kind of control the offense and their guards are kind of out there just playing a role they're not necessarily running the offense or getting those guys touches. You got Cole Anthony, Jalen Suggs, all these like guards with different skill sets doing stuff. And it all kind of flows around Pablo Bancaro and Franz Wagner. Uh, so I think that's a very interesting st style of matchup yeah. for this Pelicans team, because you got to worry about these big forwards who I think the Pelicans have issues with at times because Herb Jones is great as he is. He's not necessarily a 200 50 pound forward, right? Who can deal with Apollo Bancaro. And I mm -hmm. think Franz is not as big as Paulo, but he's still a, a bigger forward who can handle the ball. So I think that's an interesting matchup for the Pels. And also that's a team that just really buys in on the defensive end, man. They they play hard on defense. We can talk about Jalen Suggs, Jonathan Isaac, uh, Mo Wagner. Those guys really put in the work defensively. They bring the physicality, and that's something you got to really match. Uh, when those guys play at home, they play with a lot of confidence, and they really bring the fight to you on the defensive end. And I think that's something that's going to be a really interesting matchup for the Pels, how they kind of handle that physicality and how they handle when the Magic really get into you, How what's the response going to look like. So I think that's going to be a, a very interesting game for the Pels. Well, last time I think we had you on the show was the day of the Pelicans heat game in February, you know, Miami, yes. you know, kind of a benign team, just a team from the other conference. No reason to have any <laughs> animosity or issues with them None at all. And then I was sitting next to you during that fateful game and that <laughs> evening in the Smoothie King Center. What was your reaction as someone who covers both teams? What was your reaction to the altercation brouhaha that happened in the second half of that game? I was saying, Naj, nah, nah, get the jab going, get the hook going. You know what I mean? We, we gotta get the, we gotta get some fight rules going. But nah, man, I, I, I definitely didn't expect to see uh, two guys trying to choke each other on the court. I didn't expect to see Jose Alvarado try to jump and, and, and punch a man, which I never thought I would see in the NBA game. <laughs> we saw people throwing stuff from the crowd. It, it was a wild night, and uh, yeah, I think again, that's an example of the Pelicans just wanting to show that fight, wanting to show you're not gonna bully us. And you know how the Miami Heat rock. If you're ready to fight, they, they'll just throw the basketball on the side. And they, they, we, can just, we can just fight. <laughs> you know, and, and I think that'll be interesting. Uh, 
when we get to that Miami game, how much those guys want to play basketball and how much those guys just want to fight each other. And I think it'll probably be a, a, a kind of a seesaw where sometimes they want to play basketball and sometimes uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say when Najee checks in the game, I'll see how much his mind is on playing basketball yeah. and how much his mind is is wanting to go directly at Jimmy Butler. And I think, the again, that'll be a really fun matchup because Jimmy Butler lives for that type of stuff, man. If you remember mm-hmm. in that game before the fight, Jimmy Butler was having an incredible game. He was talking smack to the crowd. He was getting and ones. And I think that we've heard it a million times about Jimmy. This is the time of year that he loves. He lives for this kind of stuff. He loves the the the, the when the crowd is against them, when it feels like the other team wants to go at him and test him. Uh, I think he, I guarantee you he's got that game circled. I know for a fact the Pels have got that game circled, and I think it'll be really fun to see just how those teams respond in a real, you know, just a real a game where both sides really are amped up and ready to go. Uh because you know we know how Miami responds in those situations it'll be fun to see how the Pelicans respond and how much they can keep it to basketball and focus on winning that game versus you know wanting to choke slam each other as America's foremost Pelicans slash heat expert do we need to have you like stationed by the court to be like an arbitrator <laughs> to like make sure that cooler heads prevail do we need to have you in a spot where you can kind of s- separate and stand in as like the impartial guy that can kind of you know talk people out of any um incidents that may lead to to further problems listen man i, I shout out to my guy sherm shout out to my guy chico the security guys for the pelicans who got in there and broke that thing up because if i if i was down there and a couple six six dudes started fighting i'm gonna be like the rough in that lsu south carolina game i'm gonna be like that's y'all business i'm going this way y'all handle it how y'all choose to i'm not getting in the middle of anything with these big old dudes they, they lift a whole lot of weights and they're much bigger than me i'm not breaking up any fight between those guys i'm just saying god bless and i hope everybody comes out healthy yeah, it's going to be interesting. Look, like you said, these two games in, in Florida. Look, Orlando, how many people think they have more wins than the Heat? They do. They have 41, Miami 37. Both teams have something to play for. Orlando a half game back at the Knicks for that four spot. Will, you know, the importance of that, that means hosting a first-round playoff game. The Heat, a half game behind the Pacers, who are in seventh. The importance of that is hosting that play-in game and maybe even trying to sneak in to that six seed. They're only one game back of the sixer. So both of these games on Friday or Saturday absolutely mean as much to the Pelicans in their standings race. So it is, I mean, all of these games are playoff games, but I mean, it's important for them. Oh, no doubt. And the heat for sure want to dodge that play in because they know all too well how close they were to not even making the playoffs last yeah. year. They were mm-hmm. literally down with two minutes left in a game where if they lost, their season was over. That's crazy. <laughs> and, they, and they had to rally back to win that game, and then they end up in the NBA Finals. So they know all about the dangers of being in the play and And we know the Pelicans know that because last year they lost in the play and their season was over, mm-hmm. right? So I think both of these teams understand very well how much – the plan can be good for you because you get the win, you get the momentum behind you, you go into the playoffs, you're feeling good about yourself, but also you lose, and all of a sudden you're packing your stuff up and, you, and you're booking trips to Cabo. So I, I think both of those teams are very, very well aware <laughs> of how important it is to avoid that plan and put yourself in a position to win. And I think you're you're exactly right for the Pelicans. The crazy thing now we're talking about, can you get a game one in New Orleans? I mean, Gus, when was the last time they had a game one playoff game in New Orleans? It's been a long time. Yeah. So I think just being able to, to have that achievement and you know, if they're able to come in a game one in the Smoothie King Center, what that crowd is going to look like. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, people are going to be so hyped about this team and what they're able to accomplish this season. So I think uh, they're kind of keeping it cool and saying all the right things. But I know they very much are, are you know, motivated to get that home court advantage one right. and two to be able to say, they're the second team in franchise history to win 50 games in a season. I mean, an incredible accomplishment for a team who in November we were talking about, man, what's going on with these guys? They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're losing. They're blowing all of these games. We don't know what's going on with Zion. They got destroyed in the end season tournament. And now all of a sudden we're talking about this maybe being the second best team in franchise history. Uh, it's been an incredible turnaround. And I think they're really excited about kind of putting a stamp on what this season meant to them and what it means for the entire franchise. That's Will Guillory of The Athletic, as always, man. Appreciate the time. Covers your Pelicans and the Heat, Jim. Just a wealth of knowledge, isn't he? Always. That's why we always have him on. We Hopefully the uh, 
I'm sure we'll have him on again next season when there's a, a Pelicans. Season. We got a playoffs, man. We got to get Maybe, you in the playoffs. Pelicans this dude's already heat. pushing off the next season, bro. Maybe so, no, man. The NBA Listen, finals. <laughs> we we know the the Heat are going to be in the finals, guys. So it's just a matter of the Pelicans getting their way. There. I don't know what seed the Heat are going to be there, but they're going to win every series. We know Jimmy's going <laughs> to drop forty every game, and all of the stuff we're talking about is going to be meaningless. So the Pelicans got to find a way to get there, and then and then me and Jim will be partying on South Beach. It'll be a good. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you haven't lived until you've been part of Jim. Is podcasters only meeting just like players only meeting he slams the door all the time and says we have got to do better in our podcast you, you don't want to know i mean it's i have headaches most of the time but anyway i'm kidding hey man always a pleasure thank you bud appreciate you guys you thanks sure. will all right jim always fun man every time we have will guillory on we can do that for you know an hour or so and by the way brother martin that's our sixth reference of the entire conversation Excellent. i just think that's a new podcast record six well, references we, you know not we, bad you know what they say about records they're meant to be broken meant to be broken yes. the next time we yes. have them on uh it is wednesday which means it is western conference wednesday yes gus and i usually pick a western conference team to watch that's based on okay they're close to the pelicans in the standings and they have a very challenging or very interesting schedule over the next seven days but I'm throwing you a little bit of a curveball this week. The team to watch is actually going to be the Houston Rockets. And I think not long ago, people kind of gave up for the, on them, kind of left them for dead. I, I'll include myself in this as thought, you know, the, the top 10 teams of the West are set. Nobody else really has a chance to break through. But guess what? The Rockets have won six games in a row. They're 33 and 35 right now. They're only two and a half games behind 10th place Golden State. They're only three and a half ga games behind the ninth place Lakers. And what's even more interesting to me and why I pick them as the team to watch over the next seven days, they've won six in a row, the Rockets, and their next three games are all at home against teams that are below 500. They play the Bulls on Thursday, the Jazz Saturday, the Trailblazers on Monday. And so I asked the question, Gus, if the Rockets are able to win all three of those games, and obviously there's no guarantees in the NBA, they could be upset by one of those teams or you know the, the Bulls are playing – pretty well lately but nonetheless if houston goes three and oh over these next three games what kind of conversation are we having next wednesday mm -hmm. on western conference wednesday it's like i said it's two and a half behind golden state it's three and a half behind the lakers if the rockets can pull off this week and go undefeated against bulls jazz and trailblazers i think the heat is going to be so much more even on the golden state and the lakers and i think it's going to be really fascinating so I'm I'm kind of rooting for the Rockets to be able to sweep these three and and make things really interesting when it comes to the ninth and tenth spots in the plan. That's your Mike and offer. Give him a follow. Pelicans.com is always a pleasure, sir. Likewise, Gus. Yep, Jim underscore. I can offer the way to follow an X. We will see you on Friday, hopefully after a win against the Orlando Magic, right here on the New Orleans Pelicans Podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans Podcast. Join us three times per week on Pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Iconoffer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.